Hello, everyone, and welcome to our web uh, webinar today. My name is Medina Marione, and I'm Head of Global Cyber Defense. Um, today, we're going to discuss uh, how to optimize the value of your security investments with Orange Cyber Defense and Microsoft. Um, just to give a little bit of context, the reason why we came about this webinar is because we um, noticed an increased demand among our customers um, in wanting to implement Microsoft security solutions into their managed services. And therefore, we decided it would be a good opportunity um, and a useful opportunity for not only our customers, but also our followers and anyone who's interested in the topic um, to not only learn um, uh, and listen and learn from the experts today, who I'm going to introduce in a few minutes, uh, but also give you the opportunity uh, within an open floor to ask any of your burning questions, uh, whether those are technical, operational, um, or um, strategic, perhaps. Um, so at this point, I'd like to uh, take the opportunity uh, to uh, give a warm welcome and introduce our experts and speakers today. Um, so I'm going to start, start with Anna Bartwell, who is uh, Director of Strategic Programs at Orange Cyber Defense. Anna is uh, um, uh, based in Sweden. She is also leading our Microsoft projects, um, uh, but in a, in a global capacity. Um, Sarah Armstrong-Smith. Um, she's based in the UK, she's Chief Security Advisor at Microsoft, and Sebastian Drinkenberg, who is uh, joining uh, from the Netherlands, and uh, he's going to cover the most uh, um, technical aspects uh, today, so any, any technical questions you may have, he's here for, um, for you to answer any of them, as he is the Senior Technical Security Specialist uh, at Microsoft. Uh, at this point, I'd like to um, ask Anna um, to uh, take the lead. Um, I believe uh, you can already, uh, you already have presenter rights, uh, Anna, let me just double check. And just before um, we delve into the presentation with Anna, I wanted to add that this, um, this presentation is going to be recorded and we're going to share the recording tomorrow morning. Um, so watch the space for an email from us. We're going to share it for, to anyone who's attended uh, today, but also anyone who's registered and just couldn't make the session. Um, and feel free to share that uh, recording with any of your peers and your colleagues. Uh, and as mentioned, we're going to dedicate a proper Q&A session. Um, so make sure you add any, uh, fill in your, well, add any of your questions into the questions tab. And uh, um, uh, we'll do our best to answer as many of them. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so we're, I guess we're ready to start. And I'd like to welcome Anna to... Um, kickstart this uh, presentation today. Thank you. Good. Sebastian, are you sharing? So um, before we jump into the more technical parts, uh, Sarah and I would like to take an opportunity to look into the threat landscape uh, a little bit. Microsoft issue uh, their digital re re defense report on a regular basis, and we also uh, do our security navigator report on a regular basis. They differ a little bit because we, we monitor different landscapes. So Microsoft is based on Microsoft assets, it's cloud data, it's global, all customers they have. Meanwhile, we look into our customer base and multiple vendors and um, both cloud and on-prem. So they differ, but there are some similarities and we're gonna deep dive into that um, for a few slides on, on what we think are the high uh, importance in these reports. Next, please, Sebastian. So digitalization, it has gone extremely fast and we're doing this because we want to do things better, faster. For example, um, if you take a number of years back, an X-ray picture was printed uh, you know, on, on the real <laughs> piece of paper. Today, we send them digitally and the doctor can have it in hand within mi minutes. So we're doing this extremely fast and we also move stuff from on-prem to utilize soft services, cloud services. But what has happened during this time is that security has fallen behind. We migrate and think about security later on. That causes a little bit of issue um, when it comes to security and security incidents. 
And unfortunately, on top of that, we have um, a very uh, bad situation uh, geopolitical right now. Uh, we have the Ukraine in, uh, Ukraine war, and that is affecting the cyber landscape a lot. And it's not only Ukraine, we have a little bit of unstable uh, situation with Hong Kong, China, and other places in the world. And that is affecting cybersecurity a lot. And the fourth thing uh, that I think is still a little bit valid to bring up, and, and Sarah, you will talk a little bit, you will also have the same view on this, zero day vulnerabilities, the time, the lead time for us to patch them it has actually gone up. You thought that we've been more mature when it comes to security and we're doing a better job, but it's actually the opposite. It takes a longer time and that's not what we want to have. Next. Yeah, so let me talk a little bit about Microsoft. And again, just to put things into context uh, with what we're seeing, where are we coming from? So every single day, Microsoft collects, processes and analyzes over 75 trillion telemetry signals. And that number is just going higher and higher and higher. Now I put that into perspective, I joined Microsoft three years ago and at that point it was 6.5 trillion. So in three years we are 10 times the number of telemetry signals. And why is that? So obviously we've been in a global pandemic, so we now have hybrid working, we've seen a mass acceleration to the cloud, but a lot of businesses are really thinking about changing their business model. So we've seen a huge rise in IoT devices and you know, lots of change that's going on. And again I put that into perspective on average, we see approximately 8,000 new hosts coming online every minute of every day, approximately 800 IoT devices. Now you can imagine any one of those is not configured correctly, you're going to have a problem, the attack surface is getting bigger, and arguably that's just another backdoor from an attacker's perspective. So as much as we talk about that kind of what Microsoft sees, there's a huge array across the internet of what's going on. So we go to the next slide please. I think one of the other things that we've really started to see uh, change as well in the last couple of years is this kind of cyber crime as a service and a lot of cyber criminals are running like an enterprise so we see opportunists we have organized crime we have nation state actors um, but in essence when we're thinking about something like ransomware or one of those things why would I waste my time as a ransomware operator trying to go through multiple different companies to just to find that one that I'm going to be able to get access to. So we see lots of different things available on the dark web. There's ex um, extortion services, phishing kits, all of those different things that are available for sale. Some of those exploitation kits go for less than $200. And when you're thinking about how much credentials are worth, some of those are less than $1. So you can kind of see that the barriers to entry to be a cyber criminal are almost non-existent. And obviously the price goes up exponentially. And Anna already mentioned about zero days. Now, zero days are still incredibly rare. There are probably only a few actors who could actually afford a zero day. So that might be nation state actors, could also be organized crime. But on average, they go for $50,000 upwards from there. Um, so as much as we're talking about zero days and we're kind of concerned about these things, it is the everyday things that we're really worried about. So we can go to the next slide, please. And when we think about the state of cyber crime in particular, now over 80% of all attacks still start with some kind of phishing uh, credential compromise. Um, but they're getting better at what they're doing. And so as technology is improving, and we're automatically blocking um, emails. And just again, just to give you a, a statistic, so over 25% of all emails that come into Microsoft never actually get to the mailbox. Um, so we've already done a range of blocking with its fake domains, all of those things. And so you get, get the mail into the mailbox um, and they're trying to entice people uh, into clicking the link or putting malware onto the environment and they're trying speed is of the essence that is real key and what we're seeing is a lot of attackers may be utilizing a word document excel spreadsheet that will have a macro um, and just a user will just click on it it runs a program in the background 
And so in a, less than an hour and 12 minutes it takes for an attacker to be able to get those credentials out of the organization. And dependent on the malware, depending on the script that they utilize, it might have a little phone home. And so the attacker knows potentially there's a backdoor access through that endpoint into the organization. And sometimes that can be an hour and 42 minutes to get in, laterally move, and obviously the crown jewels is still that admin. Now the most financially impacting cybercrime of all is business email compromise. And we are tracking approximately 156,000 business email compromise a, a day, just to kind of put that into perspective. And what we've really seen when we analyze a lot of these emails, what are they doing? So I think the real interesting stat there is 67% of those emails is perfecting the law. So they're trying to build trust into that environment, of what they're doing, how they're doing it, um, learning about the organization, learning about the person, learning at the opportune moment when they're going to intercept that message. And some of those messages might be payroll redirection, trying to pay a, a fraudulent invoice, it could be a myriad of different things, but that's really where they're spending their time and effort. This is a second stage attack, so they're already in the network, and now they're trying to, still trying to exfiltrate money that's still kind of a lot of the things that they're trying to do but it's something to be very cognizant about if we go to the next slide please I just want to talk a little bit about ransomware in particular. Now, I mentioned that kind of cybercrime as a service, and one of the things that we've identified is for a lot of attackers, they can, can go through multiple thousands of different companies before they get to that one victim. And that is really why they want to outsource a lot of their stages of their attack. So we see this increase in access brokers. Now, if you look at the kind of the table onto the next side, what we see there and this is actually response back from our data team this is our incident response team and over 60 percent of all of the cases that Microsoft deal with is ransomware. And I want to give you some feedback. So what are they kind of saying with regards to um, some common issues? And the one that's highlighted there is the one that I really wanted to start with. And what you'll see is 100% of all of those customers that were impacted by a ransomware incident never had a privileged access workstation. So the second area really comes down to 98 Eight percent of those had way too many credentials. So when you're thinking about that crown jewel and what they're looking for from an attacker's perspective, um, they need the admin. Um, but arguably, if you've got way too many credentials, way too many things, it's so easy for an attacker um, to be able to, to fulfill their objective. And the third thing, we will probably die on our sword when we talk about multi-factor authentication, but it's absolutely critical. And what we can see there's 90 90% of all of those customers never had any MFA enabled for their user accounts. So I'm going to hand back to Anna. She's going to give us a view from Orange with regards to what they're seeing in ransomware as well. Great. And I think here's a um, similarity we do see uh, both uh, from Microsoft side and Orange Cyber Defense is that manufacturing is actually super high on, on the list on being targeted. There are reasons for it, but what's interesting in this picture is actually the willingness to pay. And the top three are, uh, the number one leading here is manufacturing followed by professional and threat uh, services and, and as a third place then uh, retail trade. And I would argue, I think this is due to, it costs fortunes, hundreds of thousands or even millions of dollars per minute or per hour, an environment is, that is, is down, and it can actually be even severe than that, that uh, you can't start it up again. So we do see that they are more willing to pay uh, for when they are under a ransomware attack. Next, Sebastian. And if we then compare, I thought it would be difference between 2021 and 2022 uh, based off uh, what's happening in the uh, geopolitical landscape. But it's actually very few difference between there. Still, manufacturing is leading. We have the number two professional and then technical services and retail tra uh, trade as number three. But the two first ones are actually leading higher. 
a very diff little difference between the years. Over to you, Zara. Yeah, so Anna already mentioned about the hybrid war and the war in Ukraine, and I just wanted to do a little bit of reflection in that. So Microsoft is actually tracking about 300 different threat actors. So some of those are ransomware operators, about 80 of those are nation state actors. Uh, and what you'll see on the screen, that these are all of the Russian actors in particular. So if you go to the middle where it says Nobelium, so they are the front actor behind Solowins. Um, if you sort of see second one down from the top, Iridium, they are the threat actor behind NotPetya. So just to give you some examples of who these actors are. Now, if you look at the top in particular, the GRU, so this is the military area of Russian intelligence. And what we've seen since the start of the war in Ukraine in particular, um, we've seen seven brand new strains of destructive and wiper malware. And we've also seen two strains, completely new strains, strains of ransomware as well, but it all tends to be focused in that military area. So what are they doing? In essence, they are trying to attack Ukraine's critical infrastructure. And at the early days of the war, um, we identified that they had, we'd seen more destructive attacks in the first four months than in the previous eight years. So from Russia's perspective, they were really trying to take out as much of that critical infrastructure as energy, media, communications, all of those kind of key areas that Ukraine are really dependent on. Um, but the other areas, so again, if we look down, uh, they haven't changed in terms of they're still doing espionage, they're still doing phishing attacks, they're still trying to understand policy and what's changing. So who are the kind of the main areas and main focus? Well, it wouldn't surprise you that main number one um, is the government, the government of Ukraine. Number two is very interesting when it comes to IT IT service providers. And in essence, they're utilizing the trusted relationships of those third parties um, as a backdoor access in. So this could be managed service providers, managed security service providers, even cloud service providers as well. So if we go to the next slide, please. Um, what I really wanted to kind of illustrate um, is where we're starting to see this integration that's really required between the IT and the OT and the IoT. Now, a lot of companies that operate critical infrastructure, they kind of have an air gap and they might argue that the operational technology is completely segregated from the IT technology. So what we wanted to highlight was a lot of attackers are spending more and more time in the IT environment learning about the OT. So in essence, you might be thinking that if you're doing upgrades within the operational technology, you might have CAD designs, you might have project plans in SharePoint, you're going to be talking about things on email, maybe Teams. And so actually there's a huge amount of information that sat in the IT environment that the attackers can utilize to learn about the OT environment. So they're doing their reconnaissance, they're learning about the, the business and they're learning about how they're going to be able to get access into that business. So sometimes they will laterally move from the IT to the OT or the OT to the IT. And that's something to think about going forward, about having that full visibility end to end, irrespective of where the attack starts and where the attack ends up. So we go to the next slide, please, uh, Sebastian, and maybe we could just build this slide. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about DDoS attacks in particular. And again, we've seen a huge rise in the increase of these type of attacks. Now, when we think about DDoS attacks in particular, obviously there's no monetary gain from this, from a cyber criminal's perspective. You know, so what is the point of doing these things? Well, a lot of the time it's all about disruption. It's all about causing as much um, disruption into those environments as possible. So we've seen a huge increase when it comes to IoT, DDoS, botnet attacks. Um, and this is just means that they're, they're 
hammering all of those interconnected connected devices. Um, but sometimes it's used as a distraction as well. So when you think you're having a DDoS attack here um, and you know, all your attention's over there, they might be trying to get a backdoor into the estate as well. Um, but I think when we're talking about you know, the war in Ukraine, when we're talking about activism, geopolitical tensions, we're seeing a rise in threat actors. So these are nation states, they're activists, they're all different types of actors that are really utilizing a DDoS attack as a way of actually trying to um, cause as much disruption, but the disruption from the end user's perspective. So imagine you're trying to get access to internet banking, you're trying to get online, you're trying to look at social media, and you can't get access, then you're really annoyed. And then really what they're trying to do is make sure that you're really annoyed at the company, that you can't get access to service, or you're really annoyed at the government, um, because one of the, the argument is one of the reasons why you can't get access to these services, um, is because your government is supporting this war in Ukraine and doing these various things. So it's something to be very cognizant about, as we sort of said. So the, it's the IT threats, it's the OT threats, and it's a kind of the DDoS attacks that kind of go across all of those. So, so back to you, Anna. So um, security incidents, they can come from uh, multiple things. They could be malicious, it can be non-malicious, it can be unintentional or intentional. But we also taken a look over uh, the different verticals. Um, how many of them are coming from external threats? That's the natural thing we always think about. How many of them are internal and uh, also caused by uh, a third party supplier? And it's kind of remarkable that so many uh, incidents are internal. If you look into some of these segments like utilities, um, the same with uh, accommodation and food services, public administration, transportation, and it's and manufacturing. There are more internal security incidents happening uh, that, that could be malicious or non-malicious, as, as I mentioned. I think this is due to many of these people need a little bit more learning. This could easily be fixed, I think, or not easy. One is not a single bullet. But I think education is one piece here that can assist in, in mitigating this situation. Next slide, please. And this is actually stat uh, statistics from Microsoft. So if you look at um, what's happening, that this simple stuff that we talk about continuously, and I've spoken about for a number of years, would actually resolve more than 90% of the attacks. We know that just 26% of all the users are using um, uh, strong authentication, 33% of admin are using it. That's really bad. So if you compare that to the digitalization curve that had happened over this time frame, this is very flat. Uh, I, I thought it would go up, but it's actually very, very flat. So multi-factor authentication is just must fix it and privilege account, uh, of, of course. Work with Zero Trust. Look at Zero Trust. Start to protect identities and endpoints. Follow that journey. You may not be able to do the full journey in one row, but start with identities and endpoints because that's where a lot of these entry points are. And of course, antivirus is not enough today. You need to run an EDR solution on all your infrastructure that is possible to run it on. Patching, again, I can't even mention how many times patching is super important. We need to get this resolved and get up the patching uh, on, on um, our infrastructure. And protect data. Many organizations have no clue where their sensitive data are. Take control over at least the sensitive data and have proper control over it. That will help a lot in this um, situation to, to protect yourself. Easy things, easy to fix, a major impact it will have. Next slide, please. Sebastian, over to you. 
Yeah, so um, like um, Sarah and Anna already said, there's a, a lot going on on a um, um, level of on which um, issues are detected. So especially if we look at uh, identity misuses, email, um, um, but as well what's happening on the endpoint. So how can we all bring this together? And this is, of course, where the Microsoft uh, security stack can play an important role for customers. Uh, they would want to um, embrace a zero trust architecture and basically take this as a puzzle piece to become more mature at the ability to both detect, respond and harden their environment. So um, as uh, Anna and uh, Sarah mentioned, um, many of the advanced attacks to today are actually happening on a multi-layer. So things are happening with an email perspective that may be detonated within the endpoint that may allow somebody to take over an identity and then do lateral movement and uh, do other activities. So this is one of the core pillars of why organizations should have to embrace XDR, multiple detection and response capabilities, and really have a native capability that can take in email data, endpoint EDR information, what's happening on the identity level, and as well, how does this interact with other workloads within our environment, all within single uh, solution? So uh, this actually also is related to multi-cloud, so or cloud environments, because nowadays most organizations are moving their most precious resources to clouds, as like Azure, but also AWS and GCP. And in that perspective, we have to always look at four core principles that are nothing new. So when we are looking at migrating something from on-prem to the cloud, of course, we also have to think about security by design. So what's happening? Uh, how is this configured? And how will it be running in our environment? And ultimately, uh, whenever something is in a running state, configuration drift is also an issue. So now that we have something running like microservices or storage accounts or key vaults or uh, virtual computer running in our cloud, how is it getting modified and does that potentially have a negative impact uh, uh, and, uh, to our security by design principles? And ultimately as well, runtime protection is very important in cloud resources. You have the ability to do similar monitoring or XDR capabilities that you may be looking for on an endpoint perspective and knowing how your virtual compute, your microservices, your key vault are actually getting interacted with during a runtime perspective and leverage that information to detect and get early notified and do response activities upon. Now, last but not least, these three components basically have relationship to compliance and risk. So what was also mentioned is that a lot of organizations are leaving themselves vulnerable because they do not follow the default uh, principles of cyber hygiene. So effective patching or limiting the uh, overprivileged accounts or implying MFA or limiting access to the internet. All of those components have relationships to compliance and risk monitoring for an organization. Now, this is as well something that um, we can do, of course, on a Microsoft perspective. And what you see is that I added the gray boxes of specifically items that are important to look at at a capability perspective when we are talking about cloud protection. So within the cloud space, of course, moving left or shift left or DevSecOps, having the ability to know how um, what is happening in within the CI CD pipelines, as that is now the delivery mechanism to push anything into production within the environment. That is key. As well, knowing, of course, leveraging cloud security posture management capabilities to sample your cloud infrastructure, knowing how it is configured now, but also knowing how it changes over time and how this may actually impact your compliance and risk perspective. Ultimately, if we are looking at identities on-prem, the, there are also massive identities or privileges used within the clouds. And those need to be looked at. You need to be able to understand um, uh, how your APIs are privileges. Are they over privileges? Are they maybe no longer used, et cetera, et cetera? Because they leave the organization potentially overexposed, which we would need to be able to detect 
when something out of the ordinary is happening. And this is, of course, where workload protection comes into play, where you can have dedicated workload protection plans enabled to look for specific activities that may occur on a server workload or that may occur on a database and so on. So um, uh, looking at XDR in, let's say, the office space, consider this to be XDR within cloud and also even actually on on-prem and multi-cloud environments. Then you also typically have the desire to stitch all of this information together. So how can we actually combine information that may come from our XDR environment, that may come from our cloud resources, and link that to resources that are outside of our realm. And so external sources, um, maybe on-prem data, uh, data flowing in, or also additional intelligence, uh, Microsoft Threat Intelligence, but also Orange-specific Threat Intelligence, and so on. So this is, of course, where we are talking about OpenXDR, SEMA SOAR, um, where you're able to have more options to ingest uh, additional data to put into combination of XDR and a Synapse uh, platform, um, and then basically do intelligence analysis on this. And the reason why we are saying that we're very effective to do cross-correlation is because we do data normalization, meaning that if we are receiving information from a Windows machine, a Linux machine, or a Mac OS, um, and you're looking for a login event, it doesn't really matter we are normalizing the data. Another example is how we do that for network data. So if you're streaming in Cisco IOS or uh, Palo Alto firewall data, plus maybe Microsoft Defender for endpoint network data, you can query it in the same way, as well as that our analytics engine uh, is able to look through that data in the same way as well. Additionally, what is important to know is that we also add entity behavior analytics to the solutions meaning that whatever the context is of an entity, a username, an IP address, or maybe a SHA value of a binary or an email address, we basically create unique entities of these, which allows the solution to look at behavior of how the usage of this entity changes over time. Now, that not, does not only allow you to more effectively uh, do uh, correlation and cross-correlation and lower the false positive rate, but also allows organizations to do effective hunting. So proactively scanning, looking to your data to see if there's anything that falls out of the ordinary that may indicate that there is an attack happening in your environment. But that's of course not where the story ends because if we are looking at uh, effective detection, you also need to be effective at responding to it. And this is where the SOAR component or the incident management component of Sentinel obviously plays a major role. Stitching all the information together, represented it in a single plane of glass, and also leveraging automation to disrupt an attack that is happening or to react on an incident um, in a both technical or a process way to route the resolution of a security incident in, in a proper way. So um, as you see here, this is really where we allow multiple data sources to come together and also allow you to extract data to, for long-term and audit uh, uh, storage capabilities. Now, uh, the, the other item that I also quickly want to highlight is the notion of machine learning. Um, because as we are normalizing data, we are able to enrich this information. We are looking at entities and behavior analytics. It is important to realize that the Microsoft Suite comes with a preset of analytics capabilities, machine learning capabilities, which allows customers to enable one detection that looks for 122 different multi-stage attacks. So those are out-of-the-box capabilities that customers can leverage to look at, uh, or basically leverage the consumed data to look for 122 detection use cases. If that is not uh, enough, you can, we actually also bring out of the box machine learning algorithms to the solution, which are customizable as well. Because we know of course that although uh, the machine learning logic may be smart, your environment will be also a little bit different than it is maybe than somebody else's environment. So this is also where it's important to allow customers 
and obviously through the knowledge of uh, Orange Cyber Defense to help you with this on how to fine tune the machine learning models that come out of the box. However, if you even want to take it one step further and you want to really embrace data science, that is something you can do. So the integration with Jupyter Notebox and uh, allowing you to query massive amounts of data with Synapse in Azure uh, and also uh, Azure, but also non-Azure resources really allows organizations to look at data over a much longer period of time, use that for active hunting and trend analysis. Now, ultimately, machine learning, fusion, UABA is very, very powerful. But as was already mentioned uh, by Sarah, Microsoft is generating more and more threat intelligence due to the amount of sources that we have. This is, of course, a massive important capability that will allow us to very early on in an attack phase, help organizations figure out if they have an IOC within their environment, cross-correlate that with additional events to tell them the whole story, how this threat actor is actually trying to take misuse of their uh, infrastructure components. And what I basically just mentioned now um, we started off by looking at the importance of bringing um, email, identity, endpoint, and application data together. This is basically all part of the Microsoft 365 Defender Suite, which also means that customers can grow, they can turn on a capability, can choose to turn on another, another capability, but realize that it's part of a strong ecosystem and a platform. And therefore, we can basically deliver best of breed, but also be best of platform capabilities for a customer. Now, if we are interested in XDR on, let's say, the office space, you should also really consider XDR in the cloud and on-prem space. This is where we are protecting not only server workloads, but also microservices, the cloud itself, and as well, as Sarah mentioned, very important, IoT and enterprise IoT environments. And ultimately, of course, the world does not only exist out of Microsoft solutions. So especially if you still have uh, quite a lot of on-prem resources, you want to enrich data, you want to cross-correlate information as well, Microsoft Sentinel can be a great solution to do that. That allows you to effectively cross-correlate information and then also respond to it leveraging its native SOAR capabilities. So this was a, a short introduction to what Microsoft brings to the table to the services that Orange Cyber Defense can offer to its customers. Um, and of course, uh, we will be taking uh, any questions if there are any uh, later on in this session. So with this, I will hand over back to, to Sarah. So we are quickly going to jump in and look into how Mar um, uh, Microsoft investment can be um, best utilized uh, together with our services from Orange Cyber Defense. Uh, Spasi, you can move to the next slide. So Microsoft deliver very, very powerful capabilities to match any kind of security threat. Um, that is on the market. So what we have done is that we're trying to use the full potential of these. We can do security posture analytics, attack surface reduction, um, embedded threat intelligence. So we embrace the whole portfolio when it comes to Microsoft. Next, please. Sebastian, are you moving to the next one? Yes, it is actually. Anna, you want yeah. to try and share your screen perhaps if it's not working? I can do that. I've just given you presenter rights.
Perfect. So, so our managed threat detection XDR service for Defender is uh, built to embrace the full put, uh, workflow when it comes to Microsoft and M365 Defender. We do security incident management, we do remote response, threat hunting, custom rules, threat intelligence to get a, a complete circle. And the same then for when it comes to Microsoft. Have, and that, that, I think that's really, really good because Microsoft have built uh, services that is hanging together. So what we then try to and, and they are actually integrated seamless to each other. And that's what we are also trying to do with our services. So we can give our customers visibility of the entire organization, cost effective because you can go up and down as you would like to and take care of all the parts within the M365 Defender portfolio. And we are helping customers to capitalize on this value uh, on top with our threat intelligence that we add. And of course, then also a very, very skilled security analysts that take care of the environment. So we can take an end to end uh, journey around Microsoft security framework where we can help customers to assess their environment. We can advise on what to do, what services are needed and how. We can help customers to onboard, build, configure. And then in the, as you see on the left side here, <laughs> sorry, the right side here, uh, we can provide services where we can run the services, we can detect incident response and seal services. So it's a full circle. Um, and when it comes to security, it's not only technology, what we talk about. It's also um, to build a, full, a complete picture and holistic cybersecurity, you also need to look into an organization's processes, policies, people, and any specific demands for that organization. So that's also things that we can help out with. And how do we do this then? Uh, we have heard Sebastian talking about all the signals. We do a lot of uh, more stuff on top of that. But we take Microsoft signals, we use them in our analytics, but we also add to that. So we add more than 500 data sources more into the intelligence. And on top of that, we have services. So whatever we detect from another customer, we can then protect other customers from that. And one thing that we stands out as being a little bit unique is active probing, because most of the IOC collection, they are passive and reactive, and they form a vast amount of data that is collected, and that is hard. So what we do is slightly different. We do a little bit more. We go after the hackers' toolings. We look at what kind of tools are they using, how are they using them, what kind of infrastructure are they using, and where are they? Because they move around, they are smart. So this gives us the possibility to actually create, uh, sit with uh, threat intelligence that we are very, very confident with. And we can then create rules that we uh, really, really think is really good and given high accuracy in our detections with low number of false positives to our customers. So how is this hanging together then? So we have the first service we're running uh, is WorldWatch, where we can look uh, for vulnerabilities, breaches that are focused around one customer where we can give them a, a view how it looks like for them. And then on top, we can use Defender um, and point to give vulnerability data. So we take a Defender and we deliver a managed vulnerability intelligence service where we guide the customer in how to prioritize the vulnerabilities and take a risk-based approach. We also use uh, Microsoft Entra to look into misconfigurations and potential threats in the cloud. And when it comes to the M365 Defender, that's a very, very complex suite. So we have a service that we, is called Managed Workspace Protections that we can then uh, help customers. We implement it, we monitor it, we run it for them, but we also work continuously with attack surface reduction, continuously improvement of secure score to continuously move forward in a positive way. And then on top, we can then provide managed threat detection based on Defender and Sentinel. 
And um, another sister service to that is managed cybercrime, uh, where we contain threats. Um, and of course, when something happens, we do have our SEER team ready that can stand by and jump in because we you never know when things are going to happen. And then a SEER team is very, very important to have close by. This is the way we have seen SOC services before, uh, where we basically, it has been reactive. Uh, SOC services have been re re reporting what we have done, basically, we and other on the market. Like a problem management or an incident, we send an incident to say, this has occurred. But what we are doing with our services now, based on Microsoft, is that we can move it to be proactive. We can recommend things to do to reduce the risk um, uh, appetite for, for a customer. Such as I mentioned before, security posture analytics, surface reduction. So we're driving in the right direction. We are trusted by several partners on the market. Um, and this is one example of a customer uh, that decided to go full Microsoft security because the whole portfolio is hanging together and give them the best of breed technology. They were looking for a react, uh, going from a proactive service to a reactive service. So um, we have embraced that and provide um, a proactive service uh, based on Microsoft Sentinel, M365 Defender, and the other products of Microsoft's security portfolio. So that was all from us. Um, any questions? So, yes, indeed, we do have some questions. I'll just uh, read them out. Um, so, our first question, I think this one's for Sebastian to answer. Bear with me, let me just read it out. So, how is AI used in these solutions, or how will that be applied in the near future? Yeah, well, AI is, of course, uh, top of mind uh, for everybody, and I would say even more so for Microsoft. So. Um, today, I would say that AI is pretty much still in the beginning phases. Um, of course, uh, Sentinel already has some integrations with ChatGPT, but that's then basically the, uh, the, the, the open source one. What is more interesting is what's going to do, what, how is AI going to make a difference in the near future? And what does, how does that play a major role with Microsoft? And I honestly think that uh, due to the uh, known collaboration between the ChatGPT uh, and the integration of that capability as OpenAI uh, in the Azure suite and in Microsoft uh, solutions, including in Sentinel and 365 Defender, uh, you will see that um, uh, the capability called uh, Security Copilot will basically be a massive enabler for organizations to increase efficiency. And so, um, of course, still a lot is not, uh, um, the, the solution security co-pilot is very much still in development. But what we can share for now is at least that it's aimed to be a co-pilot, so to assist uh, our analysts out of there that are trying to make sense uh, of data in a very efficient and effective way. And that is exactly what uh, AI and security co-pilot will bring to organizations that instead of do, having to do a lot of manual lookups and cross-correlation uh, uh, that, that, that they're currently doing today, they can automate that or do that much more efficient within our solution sets, um, uh, leveraging the power of ChatGPT, but also leveraging the massive amount of uh, data that Microsoft has, which it can train and learn upon. So uh, I would say that uh, the AI space is going to be very, very interesting and especially in security, a game changer. Fantastic. Thanks for um, answering that question. I, I think there's another question that um, is for you, Sebastian. So how would you compare Sentinel towards Cortex? Oh, yeah. Well, Cortex, of course, uh, Palo Alto. Um, Cortex, you know, it's, it's not that I'm going to do here um, a vendor comparison, but of course, Cortex is a good solution. Um, what I would say is that if we compare um, any other vendor uh, out there, then I would say that our massive value is, is that we are actually native part of our Microsoft, Microsoft ecosystem. 
So um, if we are talking about uh, customers that are leveraging identities, uh, so Active Directory, but even more so Azure Active Directory, um, we typically see that any third-party solution that is consuming that data or tries to cross-correlate that or make sense of identity information out of Azure Active Directory, it is a little bit more complex than they may say it is. So uh, the ability to do uh, effective uh, correlation both on Microsoft uh, identities and non-Microsoft data may coming from your firewalls or other EDR solutions even, we see that customers recognize that that is quite much effective, more effective within a capability such as Sentinel. So, um, um, and, and of course, uh, every customer will have their uh, reasons to have a favor for one or the other. I would say that probably on many cases, uh, we are pretty much on par. Uh, of course, we will say that we are better in some points and they will say that they are better in some other points. I would say that uh, definitely Microsoft uh, as a platform has a brighter future. Um, and that is also because of the factor of AI. Like I just mentioned that um, the, as we see how much investment is being done by Microsoft, um, to, to, to develop in their security solutions and as well embed AI natively in it. Um, I would say that uh, definitely in the near future, combining our current capabilities and uh, multiplying that uh, effectiveness with AI on top of it um, will we'll make the comparison against um, other vendors and their solutions uh, even, even more, more going in favor of our direction. Of course, that's... Uh, that, that's what I, what I would say. <laughs> Sounds great, thank you. Um, we got another question. Um, what are the target company sizes for MS Sentinel, MS Defender, Cloud, MS Intune? Perhaps this is something, uh, Sarah, you want to answer or Sebastian? I'd probably say Sebastian, I think, that one. Yeah, so um, what are company sizes that would be targeted, interested for these kinds of solutions? Is that is that the question? Yeah, so I would say any size, really, um, because um, if we are looking at any size of company, um, basically requires a good level of security. So uh, if we take the bakery around the corner, or we take a multinational organization that is doing multi-million dollar uh, uh, revenue. All of them have, if you like it or not, a, a similar problem. They are uh, relying on IT more and more, um, and therefore they are looking for protection mechanisms. And this is also where you will see that um, all of our solutions can be implemented in a very low scale, so let's say limited amount of devices, uh, small uh, customers, uh, up to large enterprise environments uh, that that require, um, yeah, let's say multiple stocks or, or uh, working together and orchestrating response. So uh, our solutions are definitely very very scalable um, as well because of if you look at our billing mechanisms that a lot of them are actually based on actual consumption, um, which means that as you are uh, growing or maybe even starting small, you are paying a lot less. And then gradually, as you grow, of course, your consumption, your cost will grow as well. But then, of course, the, the benefits of additional protection and security, lowering your security risk, also becomes um, uh, a fact of it. Um, so I would say um, our solutions are applicable to any size. Sounds great. Thanks for answering that one. So we've got another question there with me. My so it just froze slightly, so I can't see very me. Um, so we've got, um, how does Microsoft protect Microsoft? Do you use the same technology? That's quite an interesting question, Sarah. Did you want to take a stab on that? Yeah, well, um, it's, it's an interesting question. So our CISO, uh, Brett Arsenault, so he does not have a mandate to have to use Microsoft. I think that's first and foremost. He is free 
to choose whatever technology he, he wants to check in essence. But when you think about not only is Microsoft having to manage the Microsoft Cloud platform, we have over 200,000 people, we have 1 million endpoints. Um, and so though he's not mandated, um, then we are probably one of our biggest customers in essence. So we have the engineering, we have Microsoft as a customer itself. Um, and so yes, in essence, and, and Sentinel is actually an interesting story. Um, so when I talk about those trillions of signals we were at one point utilizing an off-the-shelf sim tool just like everyone else is, is doing that um, but what we found when we're talking about those trillions of signals and all of those different things that we're kind of having to deal with and we actually ended up having to create and build our own and that's how sentinel was actually born so it's a hundred percent cloud native uh, capability we're ingesting all of those different capabilities, um, but all of those different things, not just from Microsoft, but all of those different things combined. And so when we actually bring out new technology and we try different things, it's actually tried in the Microsoft environment first. And so as I sort of said, if you're one of the most attacked entities in the world and you're being bombarded with all of these different cyber attacks and you're creating, you're building, you're engineering all of these services. So you're not only taking feedback Feedback from customers. Um, we're also taking feedback from our internal uh, of Microsoft as well, and that really helps to build. Um, and I think probably Brett is one of the, our biggest critics, which is really fantastic because he really does challenge the engineering team about what he wants, what he expects, how it's going to be tested, it's all tested with us first, and then it gets released into customers as well. So I think we are probably one of the best references, if you like, if you can protect Microsoft, um, you can probably protect a lot of other entities as well. Hey, thanks. Um, another question is, uh, one of our, uh, someone from the audience is asking, could I use a combination of services based on different vendors, such as uh, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, M365 Defender and, for example, a checkpoint firewall? Um, maybe, Anna, you want to try and answer this one? Yes, I can do that. And, and I would say, yes, you can combine different services um, with our offerings. But when it comes to, if you take a close look at the M365 Defender, the suite of um, you know, identity, protecting office, etc. That suite is sitting very, very tight together. So I would probably not recommend to mix and blend there on, on that portfolio. But if you take a look on the other side of things, uh, like the question was checkpoint, it's absolutely possible to mix and match. Okay. Thanks for your answer. Um, got another question coming in. Um, so, MS has no physical firewalls. Is it still useful to have one on premise? Can the data from the on prem firewall be integrated in MS Sentinel, for example, Sophos Next Gen? Maybe, Sebastian, this one's for you. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. I would say uh, it, it all depends on the use case, of course. Eh? So, at the end of the day, and, and OCD, of course, uh, can help customers with that. It's about what your detection use cases are. And, and typically those are matched against the MITRE tactics or techniques. But especially if you are leveraging uh, Defender for Endpoint, which generates a lot of uh, network telemetry or has insights on what's happening on the endpoint perspective, I would say that there is a less likely requirement to onboard all your uh, internal firewalls. However, your external facing firewalls are still very much interested, interesting to um, consume that data into a Sentinel indeed, because there you can then do the cross correlation of maybe outbound and inbound uh, connections, match that of course against IOCs and how that may re be related to things happening on your backend. Whether those are endpoint systems, whether those are servers that are protected to Defender for Cloud, or maybe your microservices that is running in a, in a Kubernetes cluster. So uh, yes, there is definitely still a use case and um, it will depend of course on your detection requirements and the MITRE tactics and techniques that you're mostly interested in and what kind of attack faces uh, to consider what kind of events, what kind of data feeds you would want to ingest into a solution like Sentinel uh, in combination with 365 Defender. Amazing. Okay, so we've got time for one more question. 
I've got a great question to close this webinar. I think, Sarah, this one's for you. So today we covered a lot. Why, so where should people start? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good one. <laughs> Yeah, you're right. We've talked about so many different technologies. I'm going to keep it really simple because I know we're at the end. But I think there's two things, two things that are really, really important that I want you to take away. And it's really simple. So we have to protect the access in and the exit out. And that's that's it when it comes down to it. So the access in is identity. In essence, identity in all its forms. So it's identity of people, identity devices, however which way you get into the organization, that's how our attack is going to get in. So the exit out is really thinking about the data. What are the what the attackers after? And in essence, you can't have threat protection without information protection. So we think about the data, what data we have, where is it, who's got access to it. We can kind of we fill the gap in the middle, if you like, with the different infrastructure and different capabilities. But that's the starting point: identity and data. Amazing. Okay, so I'd like to thank all of our speakers um, that were here today and. Uh, um, shared a uh, um, great presentation and uh, took the time to answer your questions. Um, I think we got to the end of this and I'd like to just add uh, one more thing. So um, recording of course coming tomorrow and today we touched also on cyber warfare and if you are interested on the topic um, we are uh, also um, hosting a webinar on the 12th of July. Um, it's not solutions focused, it's, simply, it's purely geopolitical drivers, uh, it's about state actors shaping the current threat landscape. So if you're interested in joining that, I'll share the link as well and uh, we'll see you there. And uh, thank you so much again for attending today and thanks again to our speakers and uh, um, we'll see you soon. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.